fiction is absolutely an empathy machine for people, you know, because look, I did a ton of research on this subject and I probably could have written a pretty good nonfiction book about why, you know, late stage capitalism is bad. But, you know, journalism is important. I used to be a journalist, like I recognize the value of it, but I think people just connect differently with fiction because you're kind of putting yourself in the character's shoes. And even if you never worked in a fulfillment center, you know, you might be able to look at that and say, okay, but I remember having a shitty boss or I remember having to work unpaid overtime. And I remember my job trying to like convince me they were my family so that I would sacrifice my own family for them. Welcome to Speculative Sandbox, your audio playground for creative storytellers. My name is Vicki Lawn, and each episode, I and a guest will unpack a fiction trope with an eye for character development and narrative structures. Make sure to look for Speculative Sandbox on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, where you can join the conversation. Leave comments or questions, or let us know what other tropes we should cover. When the real world just doesn't cut it, let's get lost in a fictional one. Hi guys, after two long months, we're back with new episodes. I am so excited to kick things off with author Rob Hart to talk about The Warehouse. In his book, he explores an Amazon-esque corporation called Cloud that has become the ideal place to work in a barren dystopian future. Rob takes inspiration from real world events to create this corporation to tell a cautionary tale of our own future. We discuss advertising and propaganda, algorithms and job applications, work conditions, and the built-in failures that ensure a dependent workforce. By the end, you'll wonder where fiction ends and the real world begins. Well, Rob, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast with me today. Please tell me about yourself and some of your projects that you're currently working on. Sure. Um, so I'm the author of The Warehouse, The Paradox Hotel. Um, I wrote the Ash McKenna Crime series. I wrote a short story collection called Takeout, uh, which was all like food noir uh, stories. Uh, I did a, a novella called Scott Free with James Patterson. Um, I've done a Star Wars story in, in one of their anthologies, which was quite a bit of fun. So, mm-hmm. you know, I've been keeping myself busy. Um, as of right now, so I guess, you know, we're recording in August, so this is going to come out in September. Um, so I guess it's safe to say, because uh, I think like August 30th, we're announcing, um, I've got a comic book coming out with a buddy of mine named Alex Segura. Um, that's basically like Boardwalk Empire with vampires, which is, I think, going to be a bit of fun. That sounds amazing. And, uh, oh, it's a, it was a blast. I'm so excited. This is finally going to come out. And then, um, yeah, no, in a general sense. I'm just trying to keep myself busy, trying to figure out what I want my next book to be. I see that you have an amazing Spider-Man shirt on. So you're a, you're a big com- comic buff. Yes, yes. Um, I have been wanting to write comic books for a very long time. And so this is going to be my first. Uh, I hope it leads to more because that's really what I grew up reading. That's amazing. And then to also be able to write for Star Wars, that must be really cool to write legacy pieces for these massive franchises. That was that was funny. That was one of those gigs that I they asked me to do. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And then 10 minutes later, I'm like, oh, God, what have I done? Mm-hmm. Because the Star Wars fandom, like if they don't like what you did, they will tell you. And, uh, you know, I spent more time researching that short story than probably any other short story I've ever written. And I sent it into my editor and she signed off on it. She's like, OK, now we need to send it to Lucasfilm to like have them sign off on it. And I'm like, oh, no. Uh, and, and I will say proudly that Lucas Feldman came back. They really liked it. They had like one change, which was like, I think I like referred to like a droid designation incorrectly. So I think I did. Okay. That's great. At any point when you accept a a project like this, do you ever go, Oh no, now I have to do it. I have to pay it off. And there's a lot of pressure now. How do you manage that? Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of avoidance, (laughs) a lot of procrastinating, a lot Mm -hmm. of fear and anxiety, um, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's fun to think about. And sometimes the doing of it is really difficult. And, and granted, like, once I'm in a groove, I'm pretty happy and I'm really locked in and I'm really good at like getting my work done and, and meeting deadlines. It's just sometimes finding that groove can be a little bit difficult. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, I can, I can relate a little bit to that. I had a writing project with the media company last year and it was uh, writing a radio series and just kind of looking at the the depth of the project and what it, they were asking. Um, it, yeah, you just kind of have to go, okay, I'm aware that this is a big deal that people are looking at, but you just got to kind of keep your head down once you start working and, and get through it the best you can. Yeah. And I think there's a degree to which a lot of writing is done in like this fugue state, because I feel like every time I finish a novel, I'm like, oh, cool. I did that. That was awesome. And then I go to start a new one and I'm like, how does, how, like, how do you write a novel? Like, how is mm -hmm. that even possible? You know? So every time it's, it's so, someone said this once and I don't remember who, but, but I think it's so absolutely accurate is that writing is like climbing a mountain. And by the time you get to the other side of the mountain, you look at the next mountain and you say, I have no idea how to climb a mountain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt so foolish after finishing one manuscript and people are like, how did you get through that process? And, you know, walking them through how I got my agent, all that stuff and feeling just so confident. And then I'm like, yeah, I've got this figured out. And then I'm like, okay, next book. And then a year later, I'm only halfway through it. And I keep telling myself, I actually have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, I don't know, seven or eight books in, I guess. And like that feeling never goes away for what mm -hmm. it's worth. Oh, well, that, that's good to know. So for yeah. those, those of you listening um, who are writers, you're not alone. It's okay. <laughs> okay. So we are here to talk about the warehouse. So a little background. I uh, just like most, most of the time I walked into a Barnes and Noble and I love checking out the science fiction fantasy section of the just releases. And I saw the warehouse and I remember thinking that was such an interesting premise and, and a very familiar premise. I think that's why I wanted to, to read it. The idea that there's this future ruled by a corporation and um, what people have to go through to work for this corporation. So I'll, I'll start off by reading a review that Blake Crouch provided, um, the author of Dark Matter. He says, it's a thrilling story of corporate espionage at the highest level and a powerful cautionary tale about technology, runaway capitalism, and the nightmare world we are making for ourselves. So knowing that this is, to me, a very obvious nod to Amazon, why did, why did you write this book? What, what got you started? Well, back in 2012, I read this article in Mother Jones, and it was this really, really great piece. It was called I Was a Warehouse Wage Slave, and it was about a journalist who went in and got a job at a fulfillment center to kind of write about how terrible it was. And th there were so many things about it that just seemed so miserable that, you know, these companies, and, and it's not just Amazon, there are other companies that use them too, um, that they set up in economically depressed areas so that they're the only game in town so that you have to work for them, which means they can do whatever they want to you, which means if you call out sick, they can fire you. You know, they're paying you nothing. They're giving you unreasonable expectations and demands. And I remember reading that piece and thinking like, wow, like there is a book here. And then sitting on it for a couple of years because I was also not ready to write that book at that time because it was very, very big and complicated. And, you know, in the interim, I wrote a couple of like, you know, small like punk rock, like noir stories in the Ash McKenna series, which was like an amateur PI series, which I love doing. And then finally, I was like, okay, you know, it's time to dream bigger. Let me try this warehouse thing out. And what was funny is that I went into it, assuming the book was not going to be published, because, you know, it basically, it, it's a criticism of Amazon's business model. And Amazon controls 70 to 80% of book sales in the US. Like, why would anyone want to bite the hand that feeds it? So I just kind of said to myself, like, okay, like, who cares? I'm going to do it anyway. And maybe like some cool indie press, you know, that, that, that doesn't mind rocking the boat will pick this up. And then we submitted it and then everyone in town wanted it. It was like, okay, I clearly am not a good judge of my own work. <laughs> Well, and I think too, when you you see the book discourse, right, where there's life outside of Amazon book distribution, and you have publishing companies, and um, I, I can see how they would they would want to go. Let's look at this, you know, full bore the issues here because we're seeing how Amazon has affected us in the publishing industry and, and in many industries. People like the main character uh, lost his business because of of this corporation. So to ease listeners into this story i kind of wanted to do a fun world building exercise where we kind of play the role of a future employee and we're going to walk through the process of why they want to work for 
cloud, which is your version of Amazon, what the application process looks like, what does it look like once they're on board, living in um, the dorms. But before we go into that, some world building questions for you. Sure. What percentage of the world in your books is pulled directly from real life? And then what percentage is pure fictional speculation by you? I mean, pretty much everything in the warehouse was based on something, you know, okay. um, even and I don't want to give away any spoilers, but like that little twist at the end with the with the food, um, mm -hmm. like that was actually based on a real story, which I think ended up being a hoax uh, out of Japan. But, you know, everything that I pulled from and and what, what kind of bears that out is the fact that like, you know, I wrote about Amazon, like like this company cloud creating their own banking system. And then Amazon decided they wanted to create their own banking system. And, you know, I think a lot of what I was, was doing was either pulling directly or just reading tea leaves for how I mm -hmm. thought things were going to go. And um, I would say I didn't really get into like pure speculation until my last book, uh, which was the Paradox Hotel, which is a time travel mystery. So it's like time travel, that's completely theoretical and that you just have to kind of build from the ground up. But everything with the warehouse, I just kind of felt like I had all this stuff in front of me. It was just a matter of reshuffling it, moving it around until it made sense in a storytelling mm -hmm. way. I think from the general public's perspective, it can be hard to read negative things and this is why fiction is is like a way to kind of sugarcoat or, or make it a, an easier pill to swallow. So if you have an interesting espionage storyline that pulls people in and a speculative feel to it, where people feel at least removed enough where they can, all right, let's check out this story, then it opens up a whole world of issues that are happening in real life. And I th that's why I love fiction writing. Um, do you think that this... What do you think is more effective as far as trying to talk about real world problems and getting readership? Do you think fiction helps to do that? Or do you think it's more of a nonfiction area for appeal? Oh, no, I think uh, fiction is absolutely an empathy machine for people, you know, because look, I did a ton of research on this subject, and I probably could have written a pretty good nonfiction book about why, you know, late stage capitalism is bad. But you know, journalism is important. I used to be a journalist, like I recognize the value of it, but I think people just connect differently with fiction because you're kind of putting yourself in the character's shoes. And even if you never worked in a fulfillment center, you know, you might be able to look at that and say, okay, but I remember having a shitty boss or I remember having to work unpaid overtime. And I remember my job trying to like convince me they were my family so that I would sacrifice my own family for them. And to be able to do that and get people to kind of like key into those feelings is, is so much more powerful than just telling them like, Hey, the world is bad, you know? Um, and that's, that's always what attracted me to fiction was that it, it was a way to just kind of like pull back the curtain a little bit in a more personal way. You know, it's uh, my, one, one of my writing teachers, Tom Spanbauer said that fiction is the lie that tells the truth truer. And I, I believe that very, very much. Honestly, if it wasn't for Cloud, I don't know what I'd do. There was added footage. Happy, shiny people working at Cloud. People picking items out of bins, placing them on conveyor belts. The occasional testimonial from a satisfied customer. An Asian kid in a dorm room. I'd never have passed my midterm if I didn't get that textbook in time. A young black girl in front of a dilapidated house. There are no bookstores or libraries in my neighborhood. If it weren't for Cloud, I wouldn't have any books at all. An elderly white man sitting in an old-fashioned living room. It's hard for me to make it to the store these days. Thank you, Cloud. So when it comes to a corporatocracy, which is what we have here, or any kind of system that is designed to place certain people in positions of power and oppress others, there has to be some kind of messaging or conditioning that gets the general population to comply. And it also, so we're talking about propaganda and it becomes an, a really effective tool for hiding the truth. So propaganda is very evident throughout the entire book. You see it when um, you aren't working for cloud, you see it as part of the application process and you continue to see it during your employment. So can you describe what cloud means to the average consumer in your fictional world as a result of this propaganda? Sure. Well, I think that we see a lot of that propaganda even today where you might complain about your job and then someone says, well, at least you have a job, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's always put back on you. Like you shouldn't complain. You should just be happy. 
even if your job is really, really bad and treats you terribly and doesn't pay you well. Um, you know, we're seeing another form of propaganda right now where all these businesses are like, well, no one wants to work anymore. Everyone just wants to stay home. And it's like, well, yeah, the reason everyone wants to stay home is because you don't pay people enough to survive and you force them to put up with inhuman conditions and you're raking in ref record profits at the same time. You know, we're, there, there's constant propaganda everywhere when it comes to the workforce. And, you know, I think in a, in a large way, the media plays into that with like a lot of the stuff they've been writing lately about how like, you know, oh, people need to get back to work. They need to do this. They need to do that. When in reality, I think we need to like kind of sit down and just really assess everything around us and decide on ways to do it better rather than just try to go back to the crappy system that wasn't mm -hmm. working before. I, um, I agree with that, especially during the pandemic where you have a lot of arguments about, well, children need to be in schools, but Meanwhile, we're, parents are worried about what do that, what does that mean as far as children exposure? Can we look at other ways that we can keep people safe with without just resorting to whatever the existing system is? Right. And, and at the same time, though, that's actually a really great example of how difficult these conversations are, because like I got a kid, my daughter's seven years old, and that was a big question uh, is do we keep her? Like, you know, when, when New York City, when, when the pandemic started, New York City started this option of, you know, you can either send your kid into school or you can do remote, remote learning. And uh, me and my, my daughter's mother opted to do remote learning because we had family members who were immunocompromised and we thought that was the safest way uh, forward for everyone. And then, I mean, three or four months into it, I just remember setting up the tablet for my daughter one day and she looked at me and she was like, I really wish you put me in school. You know, mm -hmm. she hated it. She, mm -hmm. she couldn't stand it because she's a, she's a very social kid. She's a very gregarious kid and she likes interacting with people. And when she doesn't have that opportunity to interact with other kids, you know, I can, I could see the change the day we started her back in in-person school, like in her energy level and her happiness. So it's like, that's part of the problem with all this stuff is is the sort of there's no clear good answer ever mm -hmm. you know there, there's no easy fix it's just sort of like how do you make the best of a bad situation yeah absolutely and in in your book it seems that cloud is a necessary evil for people that are outside of it because there's this is a world where uh there's environmental issues you've got rampant uh basically the cloud runs the world and you don't have any other options. You like, if you really want to make a living, it's better than nothing. So then you go and you apply to be a part of cloud. And then they continue to be fed this propaganda messaging during their employment. How, how effective do you think that is to continue? I, I think about this all the time when it comes time to recruit for companies. So I work for an organization, we're working on recruiting and there's a message we push out for people. Why do you want to work for this organization? But it's important for me that we're actually reflecting the truth. And yeah. um, so that when people continue to work and they hear that same messaging, it's reinforced by actual experiences. So how, what, what are your thoughts on, on how you approach the propaganda angle once you get in the door? Well, I mean, one of the things that was kind of fun to play with is that, you know, a, a lot of the company you see through the CEO, Gibson Wells, and, you know, the book opens with him announcing that he's dying and, and. So it's not really a spoiler since it's on like the first, the second page. Um, but this is going to be a huge sea change in the economy because this is basically the guy who runs the economy. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to sort of tell the story of Cloud through his eyes as he's looking back on his life because the company had gotten so big it needed a voice. And what was fun to play with was the fact that, you know, Gibson wasn't right, but he wasn't exactly wrong either, you know, because Cloud was doing some really horrible things but they also completely changed this sort of paradigm of of you know working where you know they built like live work facilities for people which means they basically ended the concept of commuting which basically means they saved hundreds of metrics of tons of of carbon carbon you know in the air every year mm -hmm. so all of a sudden it's like through like, like their terrible things had some really great benefits in terms of the environment, in terms of providing, you know, stable housing that was affordable or, or, or as affordable under, as it could be under their weird convoluted, you know, internal money system. So, you know, it, it was the gray areas that, that made it really fun to write. And also my editor told me was one of the things that attracted him to it, you know, mm -hmm. because it wasn't just that Gibson was like a mustache twirling villain. He was, you know, <clears throat> he was right to a large degree yeah. he, he he just 
you know, didn't always accomplish it in the right way. I, I really liked your Gibson characterization. So like the Bezos equivalent of a, a man who in his mind felt he was self-made and uh, had a calling and was able to bring a lot of fulfillment and, and life and quality of life enrichment to his community. And so when you package it up like that, it looks amazing. And then you look into human error, you start um, human, um, what am I trying to say? the human human nature and how things uh, great ideas can become soured uh when you realize that they're underlying um greed or just people willing to take cut costs everywhere at the at the expense of other people's livelihood but as long as they're able to project a certain uh pu- a positive benefit it continues on absolutely and and i think that you know uh people like Gibson, when you look at people like Bezos, and when you look at people like Steve Jobs or, or Elon Musk, like people deify them. You know, if you're successful in business, then you're, you're practically a god. Um, but the thing is, is you look at a lot of these guys and like Bezos started Amazon with hundreds of thousands of dollars in seed money. You know, Elon Musk was, you know, his dad was a blood diamond farmer and he grew up like, you know, a very wealthy person. So, uh, you know, a lot. So, so and that's why they create these myths of like, oh, we started our company in the garage. We did this, we did that because they want to, you know, they, they want to create that, like we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps mythology around themselves. When in reality, usually they were rich already and they just had a really good idea or, you know, Musk, who I think actually is not an intelligent person, was just really good at hiring people and kind of taking their ideas. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's so weird. It's so weird the way we worship these people. And yet they're sort of, they're, they're very human and they're very fallible and they're not as powerful or self-starting or as intelligent as they think they are, which is, is one of the things that no one ever really picked up on in the warehouse. Um, and, and now that we're like almost three years out from the book coming out, it's fun to talk about, but like Gibson tells this story about how he got inspired to, you know, start cloud because he enjoyed running errands for the people in his neighborhood. And, and that's all made up. Like, that's not true. He never did that, but you know, it was part of that need to like self mythologize and create his own legend of like, you know, I came from very humble beginnings and very charitable beginnings. And that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. I, I can think of a couple of people in my real world that fit that kind of uh, mindset where there, there's a lot of justification behind their their actions. For writers that want to write a villainous role or a complex villainous role, being able to balance that good and that bad, what, what is your advice for them? Well, I think the most important thing to remember is that n- every villain is the hero of their own story, you know? Um, It's obviously an extreme, extreme example, but Adolf Hitler did not wake up every morning saying, I am going to cause pain and suffering and I'm going to be history's greatest villain. He woke up every morning saying, I'm the only person who knows that there is a problem and I'm the only one who can fix it. Um, You know, he was the hero of his own story. or like a more palatable uh, pop culture example is Thanos in the in the Marvel movies, where you know here's this guy whose plan to save the universe is to wipe out half of human existence to in order to preserve resources and let everyone flourish. You know, to him, he was like, "I'm the only person who gets it. I'm the only person who understands what the problem is and how to fix it." So he was the hero. And, and I think that's the thing is Gibson is the hero of his own story. And that's why as he's telling his story, it basically, it starts off as, as him self mythologizing, but sort of turns into like a, a justification and you can kind of see him getting angrier and angrier at like, you know, and people said, I did this, but that's not true. And people thought this, but that's not true. And like, why do you have to be tortured for being rich? And, you know, it, it's, it's this sort of defense mechanism. So yeah, I think that the best way to write a villain is to write them as a hero. Mm-hmm. I my, my favorite, maybe not favorite, but the most interesting discourse I saw online was before Endgame came out and people were debating Thanos's philosophy. And you had people on both sides of the spectrum, you know, arguing whether he was right, whether he was wrong. And there was a lot of associating Thanos with almost this uh, pious kind of self-sacrificing perspective like he has to do the hard job for the good of everybody but then when endgame came out i think they kind of showed a little bit more of the character's devious self-serving nature and maybe that was deliberate i just remember thinking 
Yes, like that's like the heart of of the character who who feels so entitled that he can make a decision like that on behalf of everybody. It comes from an actual very malicious, egotistical source. Oh yeah, yeah, and and I think another really important aspect of that character was that because a lot of people are like, oh well, why didn't he just use the glove to to double resources? And you have to remember too that everything is filtered through his perspective, and he was a warrior, you know. So mm-hmm. in his mind death was a solution Uh, you know like that was the most natural place for him to go as someone who's like literally like bathed in blood so you know i think as a character it really worked but i think you bring up a great point yeah you see a little bit more of that kind of pettiness and that ego when you get into the into into the the second movie Mm -hmm. a lot of the answers didn't even matter especially when you got into the abstract stuff windows in Seattle, what mattered was timing. Answer too quickly, you were powering through and trying to get it done with. Wait too long, and your relationship to reason was wanting. Then the video. No one actually watched them. As if there were a crew of people sitting in the back. It was all facial and audio scanning. Smile, eye contact. Use key words like passion and hard worker and learn and grow. The way to win the test was to land in the middle, just enough to show you were thinking about the questions. That, and don't fail the drug test. Okay, so now we've decided we want to work for this organization. Our hands are kind of tied. We don't really have many other options, so we are now going to apply to be a part of Cloud. This was a really, and I love that you opened the book with this uh, because it's a, a great introduction to how uh, there's a, definitely a loss. There's an invasion of privacy already. You lose, you, they take hair samples from you to get DNA testing, but they have this test. Can you walk us through how this test works? Yeah. Oh man. See, this is fun now talking about specifics because I wrote the book so long ago (laughs) and there are things about it that like I straight up don't remember. But yeah, I I remember. So so the test basically asks you like weird cognitive questions like, um, you know, uh, how many windows are there in Seattle or something on all the buildings or or something like that. And and I, I remember like, I think Google does something like that. I remember reading about that where Google asks like, really weird cognitive questions because they want to they want to figure out your reasoning ability they want to see you know like like it's not about getting the right answer it's about seeing how you would solve a problem uh which i thought was really interesting and this idea of like we're going to test people's cognitive skill where i think you find out like because you see the test from two different perspectives you know uh, paxton takes it and he's just kind of like this is weird and then Zinni is taking it and she's, and, but she understands it's like, you know, they want people who are smart, but not too smart. Mm, that, that stood out to me, smart, but not too smart, because there's a degree of conditioning that they need to be able to push on, on these employees. And if they're too smart, I imagine they would deal with a lot of pushback. Yep, exactly. Do you foresee, so you're saying already that Google does something like this, but at the level in which of the invasiveness, collecting hair samples, all this stuff, do you see that similar do, in the real world? Do you see us moving towards that? I think when when you get more towards like, you know, uh, kind of what I had in my head was, you know, people who are from uh, lower income areas who might have like really high standards to have to live up to in terms of like, you know, getting an apartment or getting a job where like, you know, you have to have a really solid employment history or, you know, you have to have to have a really good credit score to get a good job or you have to have this or you have to have that. And it just seemed like, the standards are so high because they're just kind of looking for excuses to disqualify people. They're, they're, they're not looking to hire, they're looking to disqualify because they've got so many people to pick from. They just want to pick the ones who are going to be the easiest to deal with. So yeah, it, it, it was a little bit of that. And, and I think, you know, I was also kind of looking at cloud, you know, the, the, there are parallels to being in prison where like you're in this facility, you live in this facility, this facility pays you money you know, your entire life is in there and it's not really safe to go outside. And, but, but, but their, their goal is to kind of keep you inside and keep you in their system. So I was thinking a lot about how, like when people get out of prison and they literally have like no options to do anything where it's like, you know, you have a record. Oh, too bad. We're not going to hire you, you know? So 
to my mind, it was like, how can I just like take away people's dignity and access to jobs as much as possible mm -hmm. based on sort of like a conglomerate of these things? At Cloud, we evaluate your skill set and place you in the position that's best suited for both of us. So then you get your job assignment and you don't get to choose. So you, you don't even get to apply for any particular position. You find out whether or not you're accepted in the organization as a whole, and then they give you your title. And many times it's like, our, like the main character, it's based off of his employment history. Uh, and then you just, that's your career. Um, so how, is it based off of algorithms? How, like how, what was your thought process behind that? Yeah, no, that's all algorithms. And the idea there was like kind of like reducing everyone to like stats and numbers and, and not actually considering the individual. Um, because to a company like cloud, everything is a stat, everything is an algorithm, everything is about just like putting the gear in the correct place of the machine, you mm -hmm. know. And I, I love the visuals. So depending on where you're placed, you have a different colored shirt. So listing real quick you're in a red polo if you're a picker, you're in canary yellow if you're support staff, green if you're an assistant, brown if you're tech, and white if you're a manager, which immediately creates divisions in the labor force. And you see a little bit of that click clickiness going on. Do you think, uh, I mean, uh, there's, there's a clear, probably philosophical answer to this, but do you think people do better when major decisions like this are handpicked for them? And is there room in this world to create a merit-based career path? You know, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I would say people do, uh, pe people are, if you give people a choice, they're always going to be happier and do better with what they have. Um, as for like a merit-based way forward in this world, I would say absolutely not. Um, you know, and you see a little bit of that where like they try to like um, Zinnia applies for like a, like a, one of those like rainbow programs where it's like, you know, meant to help elevate uh, people of color. And it was just sort of, you know, some nonsense thing that they added to make people happy. Like merit doesn't really exist there. It's just something that like they create the illusion of and they kind of dangle because it's like you have to feel like you're working towards something. But in reality, what's happening is you see through characters like Cynthia, who like started as a picker and then was basically crippled uh, when she fell off a shelf while she was working. And they were like, OK, well, you're in a wheelchair. I guess you're support staff now because you can still work a phone. Your cloud band, which features the latest in near field communication technology, is coded to you and you alone. It will only work when the clasp is done and it is in contact with your skin, so we recommend you only take it off for charging at night. It'll help you get around the facility, open doors, pay for items, provide directions, monitor your health and heart rate, and most important, assist you in your job. Due to the sensitive personal information stored on each cloud band, an alarm will sound, both audibly and in the cloud security system if it's off for too long. Moving on to the cloud band, this was fascinating to me. So the cloud band is essentially an Apple Watch-esque uh, device that gets put on your, your wrist. And it does a lot of the things that today's smartphones does, right? They It holds onto your banking account information. You can do transactions with it. It tracks where you go. It monitors your health. Um, it tracks your movements, all that stuff. Uh, but this cloud band takes it one step further which scared me actually, because I was like, the ease in which the employees at cloud kind of allow, like, just kind of like, all right, this is life now. This is what it's going to be like. The cloud band will actually buzz and, po and point directions for you to walk. So when you're going through your day as an employee, or in this case, as a picker, moving boxes from the shelves onto the, um, the assembly line, you don't actually make these decisions yourself. You are just following the the vibration prompts of your cloud band. So it's completely removed uh, a pro, like a proactive mindset to your own job. You're purely reacting to what the algorithm is telling you what to do. So can you walk me through the cloud band? Yeah, yeah, oh, that was fun. Um... So, so going back to that, that Mother Jones article that I read, you know, one of the things that stuck out to me is that all the workers in the fulfillment centers had like these little devices that would say like, okay, you know, 
pick this item from this part of the warehouse and then you would have to go get it and then you would deliver it to where it had to go and then it would say you would mark it off and it would say like what your next thing to pick was and what your next thing to pick was and apparently one of the issues was you know they they, they were really the, the algorithms were not really set in any kind of way that like was was reasonable for workers where like you might pick something and deliver it and then the next item you have to get is like you have like five minutes to get it because everything is timed, but it's all the way on the other side of the warehouse. So you've got people running at like full sprint trying to basically what's called make rate, you know, like make their numbers. And I was like, man, that sounds like like that that that's kind of the key here is like to create this this like you know shackle for everyone who's working there. Um, and also just like the, the idea of wearing a, a smartwatch, which which to be clear, like I wear an Apple Watch. And I struggle between like the convenience of it and the fact that like somewhere in Apple servers, there's a map probably that lists everywhere I've ever gone, mm -hmm. you know, and it's amazing to me what will give up uh, the, the, the kind of like privacy will give up for convenience. Um, but yeah, I, I think it was it was part of what I wanted to do with with this entire culture, which was basically like beat the sense of learned helplessness into people where, you know, you're just following arrows all day long and you're just doing what it tells you to do and it's basically like you know you don't need to have a manager over your shoulder every second making sure you're doing your job because you've literally got a device on your watch at all times telling you to do your job and how quickly to do it that makes me think of farmville or any of the apps that you play the games where every single second there's a task and there's a gamification element and there's just enough rewards to keep you interested so you hang in there uh, but after a while, you start realizing that you're just kind of running in circles when it comes to the game's functions. And it's a matter of like, is this meaningful to me? Um, is this enriching for me? Or am I just kind of blindly following prompts? I, I got to say my one, I, I don't really have any regrets with the warehouse in terms of the storytelling, um, except for one. And it's that as I was putting it together and, and I was like building out all this, this world stuff for it, you know, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if the cloud band had like a little game on it where mm -hmm. the way to progress through the game was to complete tasks in your job. And it was just another way of like encouraging people to sort of be engaged with their job on, on a more personal level. And then I was like, you know what, it's a little too convoluted and I'm playing with a lot of ideas here. I don't want to overburden the reader, but also like, this is ridiculous. This is stupid. This is insane. I'm not going to put this in. <laughs> and then like a year after the book came out, I found out that Amazon was introducing that feature on the devices they used in their, their fulfillment centers. And I was like, man, if only I would have put that in there, I would have looked really, really smart. So they're gamifying work tasks now. Yep, exactly. Wow. I mean, when I think I about... almost called it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you could have patented that. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. As you know, because of the American Worker Housing Act and the Paperless Currency Act, you do not earn minimum wage. But you can get that money back in a variety of ways, through generous housing and health care plans, and through unlimited use of our company transit system, as well as our matching retirement fund. An extension of the the band's functions, I really wanted to get into the living arrangements and the finances because this, when you were talking earlier about creating like a cage environment for the employees, um, there are so many points of failure that is put in the system to keep you where you are. So let's walk through it. Okay. So when you first become an employee of cloud and you move into the starter apartment, it's in reality much smaller than what's initially advertised. And the idea is through hard work and motivation, you can level up to a larger place. Of course, work harder, get more, right? Yeah. Um, however, that's really hard to do. They're very expensive. So let's talk about finances. Um, I'll let you, I'll let you intro. What, tell me about the finances. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So, so cloud basically, you know, they have their own banking system where they pay you in credits as opposed to money. And like, there's a way that like credits translates to money and money translates to credits. And obviously the exchange rate is not very favorable. Um, you know, and, and to, 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 to dig a little deeper, um, a lot of the book was about how government governments will basically let large corporations do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Um, without any kind of oversight because they get, you know, campaign contributions in return, which is why we don't, you know, tax anyone who makes more than, you know, a certain amount of money. But um, 
and, and I think it was in the book a little bit, this idea of like, because cloud agreed to like have the majority of their workforce be humans as opposed to automated, they were allowed like even more leeway than most. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they basically create this banking system so that they can kind of like pay you below minimum wage, essentially. And then, yeah, you get assigned an apartment, which, you know, they're, they're like dorm rooms, essentially, and just not very nice. Uh, and it's kind of spinning off this idea of, you know, a, a couple of a couple of inspirations. One is, um, you know, uh, Shenzhen and Foxconn, you know, like these iPhone cities where they have these big facilities where they base they 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 manufacture electronics and you live there and you work there. But because you you get like you know free room and board, they expect you to work like seven days a week, twelve hours a day, uh, for like nothing. And that was that that was always really fascinating to me uh but you know there's also the old mining towns where they had what was called scrip which was basically it was a town owned by a mining company where you live there you work there the, all your entertainment and hangout and bars and groceries and stuff were there and they paid you in basically their own form of currency um and so uh, again it was just like pulling from like other resources and it was it was funny the weekend the my my agent sent the book out to editors on a friday and on sunday there was this big story in the new york times about how facebook was exploring live work options for its employees and i'm like that's got to help yeah. that's some good timing right there did they ever end up doing it i don't know if they did um I wouldn't be surprised if they do. And I think that's something that we're going to end up seeing more and more as time goes on, because, you know, I think, you, you, you know, something that, that the, the American workforce has struggled with for a long time uh, that other countries are so much better at. Like, I think in France, like legally, your job is not allowed to contact you off hours, you know, whereas like here in the U.S., you're not just like expected to work on paid overtime, but if you don't, you can, your, your job could be in jeopardy and um, you're, you're just expected to be on the clock 24 seven. And so I think that introducing live work where you're basically living where you work, you know, it, it's just a way for them to pull you in deeper and, and, and remove any excuse for you having any kind of separation. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, they've taken some of your fi fundamental, like, what are they found? What is it called? Foundational the things that humans need in order to be happy and you got like, you know, shelter and food and safety and all that stuff. And what they've done is they've taken control of those things and they've removed that autonomy from you, uh, which then it makes me think of indentured servitude where you are completely reliant on them. And if you want to get your independence, it, it's very expensive. That's essentially, yeah. You know, and, and that's the reason the cloud is so powerful and, and then they can do all this stuff. And, and, you know, we see that in the real world. It's the, these companies are so big that they're pretty much the only ones who are hiring. So it's like they can get away with anything. Mm -hmm. And at first glance, I always think of the PR and marketing of these things. It, they, they make it sound real positive, right? So there, there's the convenience of not having to care, carry around a wallet or a purse because everything's on your cloud band. It's why we like our phones and people you know, pay for their Starbucks that we're using their phone apps. Uh, major costs are taken care of for you. So housing, health, and transit fees, which are things that, that sounds convenient, but you it's good to have control over those things and make choices on those things uh, based off of your abilities. Um, temporary relief provided for those who need it. I thought that was great because there's always, you know, there's always someone out there that's willing to give you financial relief, but it always comes at a huge cost. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then there are credit bonuses, which <laughs> once you understand what living or what working conditions you have, you realize are really hard to achieve, such as meeting your monthly quotas for three months or more using no sick days for six months or more. That's just awful. And I mean, it's not, uh, it's not unknown. I know of plenty of employers that don't like it when you take sick days, uh, getting a health checkup, receiving a teeth cleaning, and your pay is automatically increased by 0 0.05 credits. Every week you maintain a five-star rating, which we find out is like almost impossible to even achieve. Yep. Um, and the negatives you've already talked about, but um, like the constant, there's constant fees everywhere. Uh, they pay you in credits. And if you want to transfer it to dollars, which is a way of getting your independence, there's a conversion fee forces you to stay within the cloud ecosystem. And then you get to, you get docked for any indiscretion. So you damage their property. You're late, um, you know, personal healthcare negligence. So I guess if you smell, <laughs> like you get docked. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, I just thought that was such an interesting way to look at the positives and then you look at the actual reality and what the negatives look like. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not good. <laughs> 
but it's also like it's it's funny you know people are like you know one of the questions I would get asked all the time is like, how far in the future did you set this? And I'm like, I don't know, tomorrow, yeah. you know, it, it doesn't seem that far fetched for me. All of this stuff it, outside of like one thing in the book that is obviously like, you know, based on more theory than actual science. Um, it's all there. It's all just like, I'm just waiting for someone to find these pieces and put them all together. And Amazon is just the company that's been doing it, you know, most the, with the most diligence. Yeah. It's a it's a social horror novel <laughs> combined because once you realize this is all very familiar, it's just set in a dystopian. We are in a dystopian situation, essentially. Yep. The way the algorithm works, you're supposed to have enough time to walk to your item, pick it up and bring it to a belt, all at a brisk and deliberate pace, right? Doesn't really work like that. Sometimes the bugs have things moved around. Sometimes stuff isn't shelved right, so you lose time looking for it. Sometimes, by the end of your shift, you're motoring to replenish that line. He pointed to another young man hauling ass down a row and disappearing. You come in too far behind too many times, your rating goes down. Okay, so for working conditions, uh, we, we've kind of hinted at a lot of this stuff, but I want to talk about the built-in failures. So as an employee, you're out, your entire workday is on an algorithm and you're expected to meet quota, but all these, uh, failures have been built in. So for instance, the time it takes to get stuff and things are moved around the warehouse. So you're always kind of falling behind the fact that you're given a certain amount of time for lunch. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people can relate. You get half an hour time for lunch. But it takes you a while to get to, like, in this case, it takes 20 minutes to find a break room. Um, two 15-minute breaks. By the time you find the break room, you're back to work. And they say a lot of things, like, the algorithm sets the ideal pace, but that's not true. And then you are forced to sacrifice your own safety, like not using the carabiner when you're climbing, which could result in um, injuring yourself and getting a credit docked. So um, I, I feel like... I've seen, uh, actually right now, there's federal investigations on Amazon looking into their working conditions. And so this is absolutely a commentary on today. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I pulled a lot of those details out of the Mother Jones article, you know, because um, a lot of that was basically like, yeah, exactly what they were dealing with, where it's break time and you're so far from a break room and it takes you so long to get there that by the time you get there, your break's practically over. Um, but I also looked at like, there was um, there was this famous case uh, at Verizon. There was a Verizon fulfillment center um, where there was this woman, she was pregnant and she asked for a job at the center that would let her be off her feet and, and not carry heavy, heavy boxes. And they were like, no, you're gonna continue working on your feet and carrying very heavy boxes for eight hours a day. And she ended up having a miscarriage and mm. it was infuriating, you know, because it's like these companies like literally do not care. They don't care if people get hurt. They don't care if people suffer. They just figure like, as long as you're hitting numbers, nothing else really matters. Do you think the solution for something like that, aside from addressing the philosophy of the very top, is building empathy into the managers and supervisors? I, I you know, that, that that's a really interesting question. And I don't know, um, because I think that the managers and the supervisors are under just as much pressure to like, you know, make sure everything runs smoothly because like, if they don't do a good enough job, like they can lose their, their job. And then what is that going to mean for them and their family? And, you know, everyone's kind of dealing with these really thin margins and this, this constant fear of like, you know, losing your job and then, you know, being in trouble. And I mean, in terms of solutions that, that, that's, that was always the hardest thing um, about writing this book and about talking about the book afterward, because people would be like, what's the solution? I'm like, I don't know, burn the entire system down and start fresh. <laughs> like, I think that there, we're, we're just at this point where there's really no ethical consumption under capitalism. And the system is so broken unless it's like met with a complete reassessment. I mean, you know, I, I, I think honestly, it's less that and more like, you know, taxing large companies and billionaires and actually holding them accountable for their actions. Like, you know, if that were to happen, maybe there would be a cascade effect where then, you know, uh, there would be le like if, if it were less profit driven, maybe there would be less pressure on the people underneath them. And maybe that would kind of trickle down. I don't know. Trickle down economics never really works under any mm -hmm. setting. Um, 
it's just weird. It's weird. I, you, you know, you know, it's funny. I had this conversation with a buddy. Uh, he was, he, he was going to France. He's, he's, he's in France now. I was driving him to the airport the other day. And he was, to, we, we, we were, we were, he was going with his son, his son's 12. And we were talking to him about the differences um, in culture. And we were joking around about how like you go out to dinner in like uh, anywhere in Italy or anywhere in France or something. And you got to kind of like chase the waiter down to, to get your bill or to order something else. And, and, you know, in part, it's kind of funny, like, oh, like they, they, it's not that they don't work as hard as American waiters. It's that American waiters and waitresses are so dependent on things like tips and they're so underpaid that they have to be on top of everything. Whereas in the, in, in Europe, they're paid living wages. So there's not this undue pressure to like, you know, constantly just prostrate yourself before the customer in hopes that they'll give you a good tip. You know, it's not being subsidized by the customer. So I, I feel like this is turning into a bit of a ramble. But the point is, is if you compensate people fairly, then, you know, everything just kind of calms down a little bit, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When, when I was trying to figure out, like, how do you exert any kind of effective change? It is really hard now as an individual to be like, you could you, maybe you could say, I'm going to start a corporation and I'm going to try to make a better uh, culture. And you've you see plenty of, you know, new businesses spouting that kind of stuff. But when you think about the entire system being stacked so heavily against the individual, we talk about, you know, green living and we should be recycling more and don't, you know, drive so far. But then you have cities that are entirely built around cars, they're co commuter city uh, setups. And we we see less and less of walkable cities. And then you talk about us driving, but then you have the top one ten percent constantly using jet fuel when they go to places like you know the Kylie Jenner situation recently or the or even the Taylor Swift. So it's really hard to feel like you can exert any kind of change. Well and and that's another area where I think it, it, it's it's a lot of propaganda where you know we've been made to believe that if we start using paper straws in our drinks, that it's going to make a difference. And that's not even going to make like a noticeable dent in anything. Like what we need to do is have like really high carbon taxes and shut down coal companies and, you know, destroy some of these companies. Like there's no reason we should be using coal anymore. We don't have to, uh, we can use green technology and green technology would be so much better if we focused on it and invested in it. But it's also, it's pretty good today. It's good today and it could be better. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's what needs to happen. You know, you need to introduce like a massive carbon tax on Amazon for the amount of carbon that they're, you know, pumping into the air every year. They have to pay for it. Those are the things that would make a humongous difference. It's like whether or not I got a paper straw in my drink, you know, I, that, 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 that does nothing. Um, mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean I'm going to stop, you know, recycling. It doesn't mean I'm going to like, you know, I have my air conditioner set a little bit higher than I would like today because it's hot out and I feel like it's probably a little bit better for the power grid. Like it's still good to make small personal decisions. I do think those are really important because those can eventually lead to bigger decisions, but we've basically just kind of like, it, it's been put on us. It's like, oh, like, you know, just be a little bit smarter about your, your usage and everything will be fine. And it's like, no, we need to go after the people who don't care about their usage, who have all the money and power, and we need to reassess how they're using things. And mm -hmm. that's what's going to change things. As cloud grew, I realized it could be more than a store. It could be a solution. It could provide relief to this great nation. We gave people jobs. We gave people access to affordable goods and healthcare. We've generated billions of dollars in tax revenue. We've led the charge in cutting carbon emissions, developing standards and technology that will save this planet. We did that by concentrating on the only thing that matters in this life, family. So looking at your world, there, Gibson, mostly in Gibson Wells narratives, you have a lot of backstory on how we ended up in this world's version with the cloud and everything. And I, I thought that was really interesting. So he talks about the red tape elimination act where <laughs> in, in one way, he's just like, there's just so much paperwork. So I'm just going to eliminate the paperwork. And I'm like, it's so funny to me because things that are coded like that, what it really means is there's regulations that are put in place that oftentimes are meant to protect employees and, you know, the environment and all these things, but to have it kind of minimized to, oh, it's just pesky paperwork. I thought that was such an interesting take. 
You know, and, and that's a, a, that's one of those things, too, where, to my mind, there is a flip side there where, like, I, I worked in government for a little while and, like, yes, some of those protections are really necessary, but sometimes government is really ineffective and really puts up more roadblocks than they need to. Um, it's the same way I feel about unions. Like, unions are incredibly powerful uh, in, in terms of, like, you know, getting equity for their workers. And I've also seen unions abuse their power and abuse the workers under them in really really terrible ways so mm -hmm. it's like you know there and it just goes back to that that idea of like there's no good answer mm -hmm. there's no yeah. one way to fix all of this like we kind of have to like fix our hearts and that's pretty much the only thing we can hope for mm -hmm. yeah the idea that it could be an idealized process but we always mess it up somehow <laughs> exactly it it's like the, the the worst thing that you you can ever do is involve people in something the second you involve people you're kind of screwed then you have the freedom of harassment in construction act the paperless currency act and the freedom from machinery act which mandated a certain quota of humans and capping what can be given to robots i thought it was so interesting when gibson said i like to see people on my floor you know, being successful and making a career for themselves. How much of that was like actual, um, you know, I'm doing something to help someone and how much of it was also like self-idolization? I think there is a small part of it for him that's true, where he's like, I'm putting people to work, you know? And I think it's one of those justification things where he can say to himself, like, I'm a good person because I could have automated so much of my, my company and I didn't because I wanted people to have jobs. Like that you know, I, I think is not entirely off base that, you know, he can and should feel good about that. But it's also, to my mind, it's like, you know, we kind of, th th this is really getting into the weeds, but like, this is, this is a thing that happens all the time with like new uh, construction, at least in New York City, where, you know, they'll be like, you know, we're going to put up this new building and we're going to make this amount of units affordable and we're going to provide this many jobs for the community and like generally those jobs are like pretty terrible and don't pay very well and those affordable units are like really crappy or like <laughs> one of my favorite examples was um because if you put in affordable units you're allowed to get a break on uh some of like the taxes and the fees and then the cost of construction and there was a luxury apartment building that went up in Manhattan that created what was called a poor door. And it was a side entrance that the people in the affordable units had to use. Wow. Um, so yeah, oh, just absolutely horrifying. Or it's like how every time like some billionaire, um, you know, decides they're gonna build a stadium with like, and, and, and the state is like, oh, we'll, we'll fund that completely. And you know, you don't have to pay anything for it. You don't have to pay rent for a thousand years or something because they're like, oh, well, we're going to create jobs. Um, and then those jobs are like really shitty and do nothing for the surrounding community. You know, they, they, they don't do enough to employ people and to lift people up. Um, Amazon actually had that issue where they, um, they, they, they were going to, they were going to build out a new office in Long Island city. And they were like, oh, we're going to create this many jobs. And, you know, the mayor and the governor were like, oh my God, like, you know, change my middle name to Amazon. I think Mario Cuomo actually said that. And when you looked at it, that it looked a little bit deeper, you found out Amazon wasn't actually creating new jobs in the community. They were just creating, like they were creating slots that other people who were already in the company were going to fill. Mm. So they were trying to make you believe like, we're going to go into the projects and we're going to pull people out and teach them program and teach them how to better their lives. When in reality, they were like, oh no, 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 no. It's, it's the, the managers and the people who make a lot of money who just want to live in New York City instead of California. Mm. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's all smoke and mirrors. What do you say to people who hear or read the book and they're, I, I don't want to say cloud sympathizers, but you know, people who are, who are very defensive of the, the existing system and they say, well, you know, capitalism is better than any alternative and, you know, we should be thankful for what we have. What, what's your, your thought? See, that's funny um, because I, I've only gotten that kind of pushback one time. Mm -hmm. And of course, of course, it was an event I did for the Harvard Club uh, or like the Princeton Club. It was one of those dumb Ivy League schools where like some dumb conservative was like, well, you know, 
I guess, oh God, I, I'm really wishing I could remember it because he said something so stupid and I said something pretty clever in response. <laughs> um, but it happened so quickly that it kind of like, and it was so silly to me that it kind of went out of my head, but it was something about like, I was talking about how, you know, it's not okay for workers to not be compensated. And it was something about how like, well, you get compensated when you, we buy your book or maybe we shouldn't buy your book or, or some nitwit mm -hmm. nonsense like that. But, um, and I talked a little bit about, hey, you know, like it's important to pay for my book because it doesn't just support me. It supports, you know, the, the editor and the marketing people all the way down to the janitor who works in the Penguin Random House building. So, you know, but also at the same time, these people are all grossly underpaid. And, you know, anyway, it was, yeah, I had to be there. It was way more clever in person. Okay. Well, Rob, thank you again so much for joining me today. I was really excited to talk to you about this book because I really enjoyed reading it. Do you have any last remarks or current promotional projects that you're working on? Uh, you know, in terms of last remarks, I would just say, you know, I really appreciated this conversation because, you know, it, it, it's so fun to like talk about the book, but also like to get questions I haven't gotten before and to like, oh, good. Actually I'm glad. have to like think about it, you know, um, because it, it's, it, it's also like, it's three years out now and I worked on it for so long. So there's a part of me that like, doesn't always remember what I wrote in it, but there's always that part of me that's like, so excited to revisit it and discuss it. So thank you. Um, yeah. And then current promotional stuff. Yeah, I'm just in this weird liminal space where nothing's technically out yet. But, you know, I guess since this is coming out in September, I would say go to Comixology and get Blood Oath, um, which is the new comic book for me and Alex Segura and Joe Eisma. Speculative Sandbox is a volunteer-run podcast that relies on the collaboration of fellow creators like you. Join the conversation and participate in fun polls and questionnaires on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Interested in being in a future episode? Our DMs are open, or you can email speculativesandbox at gmail.com.